Dennis Nilsson is one of Britain's biggest serial killers of the 20th century. He's admitted to murdering 15 young men at his homes in London. What drove an apparently respectable civil servant to go on a four-year killing spree? Why did he confess all to police? And who were those who escaped his murderous attacks? Dennis Nilsson always referred to the day of his arrest as the day that help came. He knew the police would be there and he knew that his life from this day onward would be entirely different and he was prepared for it. On the 9th of February 1983, police were called to 23 Cranley Gardens in North London. Human remains have been found in the drain leading from Dennis Nilsson's upstairs flat. In the time we were waiting, I was trying to work out what kind of guy was going to walk in through that door. How was I going to handle him? Um, was I going to have to be firm with him right from the off? Uh, maybe he's... Uh, a little bit uh, strange. Uh, maybe I've got to handle him differently. Are you Dennis Nielsen? Yes. I'm Detective Chief Inspector Jay from Hornsey Police Station. I've come about your drains. Since when have the police been interested in block drains? I'm upstairs and I'll tell you. His manner was calm. He was quite relaxed. By the way, these are my colleagues. Are they health inspectors? No, they're police officers. This is Detective Inspector McCusker and this is Detective Butler. He looked like Mr. Ordinary. He had a suit on. He had steel-rimmed spectacles. In the context of what he'd done, he was frighteningly normal. As soon as he opened the door to his apartment, the smell of death came out of the doors. He knew what was in there, and he knew that we were going to find what was in there. The reason I'm interested in your drains is because they were blocked with human remains. Oh, good grief, how awful. Don't mess about. Where's the rest of the body? In two plastic bags in the wardrobe next door. I'll show you. I think, in a way, there was some relief there from him. But it was all coming to an end. What's been happening? I put my head inside the front room and there was this distinct Coming smell of decomposing flesh. I'll tell you about it at the police station. Presumably you're going to take me there. What you want is uh, in there. It's locked. I don't think I even looked in the wardrobes that were in the room. These are the keys. You can stay locked for the minute. I can smell it. I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder and taking you to Hornsey Police Station. You're not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so. But anything you do say may be taken down in writing and may be given in evidence. Okay. On the way back to the police station, he started to tell us that it was 16. At least he thought he'd murdered 16. But at the first interview, when we sat down with him and, and, and listed all of the victims, uh, it was quite clear it was 15. I arranged to have a photograph taken of Nilsson. Normally, it's uh, simply the face, but in this case, in the seriousness of the offence, I thought it better just to have a complete, uh, full-length uh, picture taken. I think it's absolutely incredible that he had gone on for so long, and I think if he had been able to work out how to get rid of the bodies in a better way, uh, he would have killed a lot more people. It was my judgment that got the guy caught. And uh, if I hadn't have pushed it, then the guy, would have, um, the guy would have gone away with it and possibly still doing it now, you know? Nearly a week before Dennis Nielsen was arrested, the toilets at 23 Cranley Gardens had become blocked. 
all five tenants in the building got together and decided to complain. The letter was delivered to the landlords, handwritten, uh, saying that this was an intolerable situation. It was inhuman to be expected to live in these conditions. And that letter was written by Dennis Nilsson, which can lead only to one conclusion, that he knew the game was up, he knew he was going to be arrested, he was relieved that he was going to be arrested, and he engineered his own arrest. I was called to 23 Crown and Guns because it was a blocked drain. Lifting the manhole cover uh, was... Uh, the, the smell was unbelievable. I was down there at least five or six times, and by that time I'd recognised you know, various body parts that were most definitely human. I then made the phone call to my boss, surrounded by the residents of the house and Nielsen. My boss said quite graphically to leave it and we would return in the morning. In the hours before the plumber was due to return, Dennis Nielsen seems to have had a change of heart. He made a last-minute attempt to cover his tracks. Two witnesses told us that at 1 a.m. Uh, the previous uh, morning, they had heard noises, and when they checked, they found that the guy upstairs, who they knew as Dennis, um, was uh, standing at the door of the apartments, and he was um, wearing a vest, he was sweating, and his arms were all dirty. And this was a cold February evening, and what he had been up to was that he had been out and he'd gone down the manhole and he'd removed the parts of bodies that Dynarod had, uh, had uh, put on the ledge in the, in the manhole. The following morning on lifting the manhole cover, I wasn't surprised that it was empty, it was spotless. I inserted my arm in the pipe on the house side and uh, I managed to get a, a strip of flesh. It was explained to me that they had unblocked a drain and revealed what looked like uh, remains of um, a human body and, and some pieces of bone. I decided that the best thing that I could do was to take these off to a pathologist, and he said, um, you're right, it's human. He said, uh, not only is it human, he said, but your victim's been strangled. By pure chance, I had taken to him a piece of the victim's neck and there was a clear ligature mark on it. This was an extraordinary case from the very beginning because for the first time ever, uh, we had a murder in reverse. We had a man saying, I've murdered 15 people and we didn't know that anybody had been murdered until the day we arrested him. The case was extraordinary for another reason. The man police were about to question had once been one of their own. News of the sensational discovery at Cranley Gardens hit the newspapers within 24 hours. Detectives suspected the information had leaked from the police station, but the tip-off had come from the plumber. the story had to be told. It was just horrific. I rang the guys from the mirror. Uh, they were round at my house within half an hour. All I got paid for that was 300 and something pounds. It was, it was nothing. The mirror was the only paper to use the story on day one. On day two, everybody used the story. We were conscious of the fact that we had the world's press looking at us, and we wanted to get it right. Peter Jay was one of two officers who interviewed Dennis Nielsen 16 times over a total of 31 hours. We had decided that there was a risk with Nielsen, that he might suddenly flip, and we may not get all of the information out of him that we wanted. I must first remind you that you are under caution, which means you're not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so. So we set up a little interview situation in my office and we treated him with kid gloves. I think Nilsson enjoyed having an audience and I think he had a live audience for the first time in his life and he was able to control the police and have them there and keep them interested in what he was saying and I think that really feeds into his ego quite a bit. 
you understand the caution? Yes. Yesterday evening with other officers, I went to your flat, where in the front room, in a wardrobe, we found two plastic bags, which we took to Hornsey Mortuary. When the bags were opened, they were found to contain dismembered parts of human bodies. Would you like to explain how that happened? In what context? How they came to be there. Have you searched the rest of the flat? Why? There's some more in a tea chest in the corner of that room and under the inverted drawer in the bathroom, the total of which are the remains of three people. I killed them by strangulation. I used something like string to do it. I cut up the bodies on plastic sheeting in the front room using one of two knives in the kitchen. Nelson was very determined to show that he wouldn't be intimidated, that he wouldn't be surprised above all, that he would do the surprising. He wanted to tell them everything, but he wanted to do it in his way and at his pace. If you've got a, a, a serial killer, you think you're going to be facing somebody with evil eyes or someone who has an aggressive look about him. Um, but he didn't have that at all. He was relaxed, he spoke clearly. He's quite an articulate sort of guy. It was very, very hard to associate what he'd done with Nielsen the man. <clears throat> We're dealing with Cranley Gardens. I understand that you told my officers that you'd previously lived at Wilsdon Green. Yes, uh, 195 Melrose Avenue, NW2, where I occupied the rear ground floor flat with exclusive use of the garden. What will we find there? Unless the site has been completely cleared by contractors, there should be much evidence of bone ash in three locations, which are the remains of 12 or 13 people. Nielsen had lived at Melrose Avenue for six years. He drew a map of the garden there to show police where he'd burnt his victims. As detectives moved to their second crime scene, the media followed. The story was dominating the newspapers, and Nielsen was becoming increasingly fascinated by the coverage. He asked me about the publicity. Was there much? And I told him that there had been considerable publicity about the case. Why he wanted to read about himself, I really don't know. Whether he was now starting to enjoy the thought of notoriety, maybe there was an element of that. It wasn't an enjoyment of being in the news. It was a determination that the press should get it right. And that if they reported something as having occurred in April 1979, when in fact it was May 1979, he'd be furious at their ineptitude and inaccuracy. Those are the things that mattered to him. Dead things. Things which have no life blood in them, but are simply facts. While the media waited outside Nielsen's flats for news, inside a detailed forensic examination was underway. It was a horrific job. I mean, it was the only case that I've ever experienced where it gave me uh, a disturbed sleep <laughs> at night. Um, so it was, um, from that point of view, quite unique in my experience. In Cranley Gardens, we found the remains of three bodies. What Nielsen had done was to sever the bodies. He'd cut them up into five parts. The heads had all been boiled in a large saucepan that he had in the flat. And the purpose of that was to uh, enable him to remove the flesh, uh, flush that down the toilet, and then dispose of the bones uh, through the ordinary dustman. They showed me the uh, wardrobe with the two uh, bags in it. In the first bag, there was a part of a torso, and in another, there were dissected pieces of chest tissue. We had to piece the tissues together and uh, portion the various limbs that had been dissected from the bodies into their rightful place. The horrific details of Nielsen's crimes were already public by the time he first appeared in court. 
48 hours after his arrest, Nielsen was to face the first of many murder charges. I remember when he appeared at Highgate Magistrates Court because we all got a, a good look at him. Nowadays, of course, they put raincoats over their heads. And I've always wondered whether the police made sure that Nielsen didn't have one to put over his head. He declined to have a blanket put over his head. He totally refused. He said he had nothing to hide and he wanted to go out and uh, if he was photographed, he was photographed. It was precisely 10 o'clock when Dennis Andrew Nilsson was led into the dock to face the bench of three magistrates. The, charge, a single charge of murdering Stephen the television was going on in the background and I looked across and, and said, my goodness, that's Des Nilsson. I used to work with him. All, all these gruesome details are, are, are all unfolding and they were all perpetrated by someone that I'd spent a year working with and sometimes socialising with. And it was very difficult to put the two together. Within days of Nilsson's arrest, it emerged that the man who was one of Britain's worst ever killers had been a policeman just a few years before he murdered for the first time. We were both probationers together and uh, I was quite happy to go out and patrol with him and uh, I, I never felt uncomfortable with him at all. If I did, then I, w I would have said something. And, and some, But no, he was just an ordinary PC. In the years Dennis Nilsson killed, he was working as a civil servant. His uniform careers as a policeman and a chef in the army were behind him. He lived alone in a respectable North London suburb and managed to lead what from the outside appeared to be a perfectly normal life. Had you met Nilsson before his arrest in February 1983, you would not have found him a remarkable person. He was intelligent, he was efficient, with a sensible job, had a pet dog, did ordinary things. Uh, it would never have occurred to anyone to think that he was dangerous. But... Uh, that is what makes a case like this so interesting, because it reminds one that murder of this kind is a secret undercurrent. What started you off in 1978? That's something I've never stopped asking myself. Normally, when you have a murder, you have a motive. We tried to get from Nielsen some sort of explanation but we couldn't get one. And Nielsen would turn it round on us and he'd say, well, why do you think I did it? First time was uh, 30th December, 1978, after a bout of drinking at the Cricklewood Arms. Closing time, I was talking to this guy and he became aware that I had a bottle at home and he came there with me. In the morning, he was lying on top of the bed, fully clothed. On one of the beds, I was on the other bed. He was dead, and I came to the conclusion that I'd killed him. Why did you come to that conclusion? Because he was dead. I got the impression that he wanted to go. That I wanted him to stay. The body was looked after. It was washed. It was put in a comfortable position. It was put into bed. This must have required some exertion, but this was the enjoyment for him. He then would leave him for the day, come back from work at the end of the day and say, guess what happened to me today? Have a conversation. It's all a very unpleasant, uh, very weird deeply disturbed fantasy. The identity of Dennis Nilsson's first victim has never been established. His second, 23-year-old Kenneth Ockenden, had gone missing in December 1979. He'd been the subject of a high-profile missing persons campaign, but he was killed the day he disappeared. Of the people that you killed in Melrose Avenue, can you remember the names? Yes, about three. The second one was Ken Ockenden. His story was on TV. 
Kenneth James Ockenden emigrated to Canada with his parents in 1970. A quiet, neat, precise man, he was interested in photography and rock music. He stayed for a while in a hotel in London's King's Cross area, until one damp and overcast Monday morning, shortly before he was due to return to Canada, he simply went missing. Ken was a tourist on holiday, alone in London. He met Nielsen one lunchtime in a pub. For one reason or another, they went back to Nielsen's flat, and uh, I think Nielsen said he cooked him something to eat. On the 3rd of December 1979, Kenneth Ockenden left his hotel at between 9 and 10 in the morning. It was the last time he was positively seen alive. Ockenden announced that he was going to go home, if not that night, then the next morning, and that that would be the end of the relationship. Uh, this, to Nielsen, was the red rag. Uh, because it was going to remove from his control, from his decision, whether or not this friendship should continue. Ken was sitting in Nielsen's flat, having a drink, listening to music, had some headphones on. Nielsen got hold of the wires on the headphones and strangled him. In December of last year, the police said there was a strong possibility that Kenneth Ockenden had been murdered. There has, up until now, been no trace of the missing man. Ockender was killed in order that he should be kept, in order that Nilsson should exercise his right in his warped mind to, to decide that this is somebody whose company he wanted to keep. In relation to the victims of Dennis Nilsson, they have been perceived by the press as misfits um, and sometimes, you know, there's a perception that, that they're all homosexual, but this wasn't the case. Uh, some were tramps, some were homosexual, some were rent boys. Um, some were, were completely straight people that had gone back to his house, and he was a trained chef, and one of his ploys would be, come back to my place for a meal, I'll give you a decent meal. Martin would always say, oh, I'm, a, I'm, a case, I'm in catering, I, I like doing this cookery or whatever. He used to do most of the meals, especially at Christmas time, the Christmas dinners. Martin Duffy was Dennis Nielsen's third and youngest victim. He met his killer on a train to London in May 1980. He was only 16 years old when he died. Nobody bothered whether they went missing or not. That was what Nielsen said. They don't care about them. Nobody's bothered them. They don't even look for them. How does he know? Did he know that I spent two years trying to find traces of Martin? remember on what would have been his 18th birthday, I bought a birthday card and I sat in a cafe downtown and wrote on it as though I was talking to him. It's your 18th birthday, if this ever finds you, then, you know, where have you been, how are you, whatever, and all that. It's just something you did, just to, just to do something, I suppose. Everybody, but everybody, seems to lump them all together as homeless drifters and homosexuals, rent boys, the meat rack in London, all these phrases come trotting out again. And you think, what the hell? What? Why? Why me? Martin Duffy was one of only four victims whose full name Dennis Nilsson remembered. The police had to find other ways to identify the remaining 11. They spent much of the next year trying to turn the numbers on their victim list into names. And they delve deeper into the incredible background of their serial killer. Dennis Nilsson couldn't remember the names of most of his victims. The police were able to uncover the identities of some, but to this day, eight of the men Nilsson claimed to have killed and burnt at Melrose Avenue remain unidentified. The evidence from Melrose Avenue consisted of several thousand broken, charred, blackened, fragments of bone. An anatomist found that there were six bones from the lower end of one arm. So she was able to say without doubt that there were academically six people involved in the deaths that occurred at Melrose Avenue. We had perhaps more hopes of identifying more of the victims than we actually did. At Cranley Gardens, there was more for the medical team to go on. One of the bodies from Cranley Gardens had the scar on both sides of the jaw from an old fracture. 
the police checked the missing persons list and they found that it was a man, Graham Allen, who, according to his girlfriend, had been involved in a fight. With the help of the odontologist, we were able to fit a denture which he uh, should have collected from his dentist but had never done so. There was no doubt about it that this was uh, Graham Allen. Graham Allen was 28 and on a missing persons list when he met Nilsson in the West End of London. He went back with him to Cranley Gardens and was killed that night. There was only one uh, victim where identification of cause of death was made and that was in the case of Stephen Sinclair, where massive hemorrhages in the skin of the face were clearly indication of strangulation. Stephen Sinclair was Dennis Nielsen's last victim. He was jobless, homeless, and 20 years old. He was murdered just a week before Nielsen's arrest. We had to take Nielsen's word for it that he'd strangled his victims. Nothing that we could find would identify the trigger for that act. Nielsen told us quite frequently that the combination of alcohol and music would put him on a high. Whether the combination of alcohol and music triggered the killing, I'm not so sure. Can you tell me what happened when you got back to your flat? By then it must have been after nine. We sat down and started to drink. I was drinking whiskey and he drank lager. He was later sitting in the lounge, starting to nod off. I can't remember anything else until I woke up the next morning. He was still in the armchair and he was dead. On the floor was a piece of string with a tie attached to it. I know I must have killed him. One of the things that we were looking for was evidence of premeditation. Where did you keep this piece of string? Must have made it up that night. I'm going to show you exhibit BL8. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. We thought we had some evidence of premeditation, but it was nothing that he had planned in advance of, of the encounter that evening. I think the tie and the string um, was something that he, he just put together there and then. It was just a sudden, impulsive act of killing. Are you a homosexual? No. For convenience sake, I am asexual. To relieve people of social responsibilities, I've said I'm gay. People ask me because I'm not married. In fact, people leave you alone. I thought I was gay. He did say, with reference to certain of the people who died, uh, that they had beautiful bodies when they were corpses. And he admitted to me that uh, he enjoyed the contemplation of that beautiful body. The question is still open. We'll not know. It is possible that he used the corpses for sexual, as sexual objects. Only he knows that. Nielsen told the police about a relationship he'd had with David Gallishan, who he'd shared the flat with at Melrose Avenue, shortly before he began murdering there. This home movie footage, shot in 1976, is a record of their 18 months together. Nielsen said the relationship was not sexual. It certainly became our impression that they were almost husband and wife, in as much that Dennis, I think, at one stage went to work and Galashan would stay home and look after the flat. He did the garden, he had a pond put in. They were involved in buying the dog together and it was almost like a, uh, a, a relationship. Don't stand there with your hand on your hip, you're like a big fool. The home movie that Nelson made was, again, a perfect example of somebody who is being a control. 
at some point, Galichen is holding the camera, and Nilsson, first of all, displays his need to control what is happening, and secondly, the anger, which is never far below the surface. I can't understand you. I ask you to fucking start filming from the feet slowly up to the head. And you go zip, a zip, pan. Bloody hell, don't you, don't you ever watch movies? You must see thousands of movies. You must know what it's like. They're training fucking chimpanzees at Cape Canaveral to operate a camera. Anybody can do it. He is the producer. He's the director. He is, in fact, the main actor in it. What else can I say? I'm so bloody annoyed. I have to think about this. Cut off. And uh, this is very, very important a facet of his personality. Bloody dick, cut this now. That he, was, he could never be content with being someone to whom things happened. He was someone who made things happen. Cut. I think he was deeply shocked when Galishin suddenly left. Hello, honky tonk. How are you? I think that was very much in his mind whenever he had victims uh, or visitors to his flat. You know, I like this guy. Is he going to leave as well? David Gallishan died in 1992, but at the time of the investigation, he told the police Nilsson had never been violent towards him. But Nilsson himself pointed detectives towards other men who would tell a different story. On about seven occasions, I've made unsuccessful attempts to kill people. Police were called a couple of times and allegations made but nothing ever happened. What did you say to police? <sighs> Told them that man must be drunk. I denied it and put on a convincing act. I think the fact has to be faced that while the police investigation that, that ended up with the trial was exemplary, I think some of the other aspects of police involvement with Dennis Nielsen over the years were pretty appalling. There are records of at least three and possibly five occasions when complaints were made to the police about attempts at strangulation after lots of alcohol. We could see that at some stage someone was going to accuse the police of not doing its job, that Nielsen should have been caught earlier. We went through all of those incidents with a fine tooth comb. And we were happy at the end that, albeit with hindsight, there was a hell of a lot going on. There was no way that anyone could have known that anything as serious as this was happening. I think if you get some uh, half-drunk, um, hysterical homosexual coming to a police station in the early hours of the morning, I don't think they'd necessarily be treated terribly seriously. The men who'd escaped Nielsen's attacks became the focus of the murder investigation. Nielsen gave us a lot of information about uh, people that he had attempted to strangle, and for one reason or another, they'd got away. And that was very, very useful for us, because we were still looking for a motive. He was leading us to live witnesses. <laughs> BL88, a yellow metal earring with green beads. BL89, another one. It was from an attempt victim, both earrings. One of the guys we wanted to trace was a lad called Carl Stotter. I met him in Camden. I was 21 when he tried to kill me. He invited me back to his place. We got into a cab and went to um, Cranley Gardens. We had a couple of drinks and uh, we listened to some music. I think it was Laurie Anderson's Oh Superman. <laughs> It seemed like an old house. Um, there was sort of like um, a smell in the house, um, which I put down to age. Um, he said he had a dog, so I thought maybe, you know, doggy smells. But it wasn't sort of like anything that really 
sort of like bothered me at the time. Um, obviously, what I didn't realise was that there was decaying bodies in the house. We, we went to bed. There was a little bit of physical contact, not much. And he um, told me to be careful of the sleeping bag zip, which had sort of like come away from the sleeping bag, um, because I might get caught up in it. I woke up with the, the, the sleeping bag zip around my neck. And as I put my hands up to feel where the pressure was coming from, I thought Nelson was trying to help me out of the zip. And then the next thing I remember is being immersed in, in um, cold water, um, which was when he tried to um, uh, drown me. I remember coming round and I had no memory of what he'd done. And he said, I got caught up in the sleeping bag zip. And I did say something about the water and he said, I had to put you in cold water because you were in shock. I was in a lot of pain. My face was slightly swollen. There was small blood hemorrhages all over my face. So I just got myself to the hospital. The doctor turned around and he said, well, I, th I think somebody's trying to kill you. And, I mean, the thing is, you know, <laughs> somebody's going to try and kill you. They're not going to let you walk out of their house. It was actually, I think, three months later when I actually started to get flashbacks. I spoke to family members. Um, and we all just thought, well, you know, go and get some psychiatric help because probably my mind's magnified it, exaggerated it, and I sort of like managed to convince myself that it, it was just me. We went and saw Carl Stotter, and we just asked him for his story, and when he told us what his recurring dream was, it dovetailed completely with what Dennis Nielsen had said. I was told afterwards that he'd actually given me heart massage and mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and brought me back to life. Nielsen claimed because he thought what passed between us was a thin strand of love and humanity. And the police said it was simply because there wasn't enough room in the flat to, to have another body sort of like um, hidden there. Carl Stotter's evidence was vital at Dennis Nielsen's trial. The defence argued that the killer suffered from an abnormality of mind and was of diminished responsibility at the time of the murders. The confession Nielsen gave to the police in the days after his arrest provided the backbone for the prosecution case. We read out the notes of all of the interviews in open court. I think people were just generally staggered by what he'd done, finding it hard to grasp. The jury had to decide, was Nielsen mad or bad? It ended up with one psychiatrist, that was our psychiatrist, saying that uh, he was uh, perfectly sane. Uh, one said he wasn't. And the third one, after cross-examination at the Old Bailey, um, said that he couldn't be absolutely sure. So we ended up with a draw. I was crucial to the case in proving that he was not of diminished responsibility at the time. That's why he um, warned me about this, the zip on the sleeping bag, because it was in his intention to kill me. He went out to look for a victim, and he found one. On the 4th of November, 1983, Dennis Nilsson was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. But even for those closest to the case, what drove Nilsson to kill has remained a mystery. I've thought about Nielsen on and off over the years. Uh, I still want to know why. The jurors at Dennis Nielsen's trial were expected to take a few hours to decide whether he was sane or not.
but it was two days before they returned their verdict. By a majority of 10 to 2, they decided that Nielsen should be held fully accountable for his actions. To be insane, you have got to either not know what you're doing when you're doing it, or to know what you're do doing but not know that it's wrong. Now, Nielsen knew what he was doing and he knew it was wrong. So, ergo, he is sane. At the same time, he was able to put the head of somebody he'd known, the severed head, into a cooking pot on the stove. He was able to keep it simmering all night. He was able the next morning at breakfast to pour himself a cup of coffee and to butter a slice of toast and at the same time turn up the heat to make sure the head was simmering properly. Now that is completely mad. I think if you're looking at it in terms of mental health legislation, if he isn't suffering from clearly defined psychiatric illness, then he can't be seen as mentally ill. The problem is, you either have a personality disorder or you don't. And if you have a personality disorder, you fit into a particular box. And Nielsen didn't really fit into any one of the known boxes. In 1985, Brian Masters published his book on Nielsen's case, Killing for Company. He'd been corresponding with Nielsen since the weeks after the arrest. Not knowing that one could not approach somebody awaiting trial on a capital charge, I wrote to him. He did reply, and his first letter um, haunted me for weeks afterwards because it said, Dear Mr Masters, I pass the burden of my life onto your shoulders. In prison, Nielsen filled 50 notebooks with writings and drawings for the author to study. They contain clues which may point to the roots of Nielsen's killing addiction. Nielsen always had a camera from, the, from his teenage years onwards. And the camera for him was a way of stopping people from moving about. He would photograph people and encapsulate them and, as a butterfly is pinned to a board, they were pinned to a photograph. And he even got to the point when he was in the army of getting his friends to lie down and pretend they'd been shot. He then escalated still further by putting makeup on himself to make himself look dead and placing himself in front of the mirror so that he could fantasize that that was a corpse. So the, the murders were the final point of the escalation of this fantasy. He was, I'm afraid, completely taken with the notion of death, of corpses, of dead people, of immovability. Nielsen's fascination with death was fed by his experiences in the army and the police force. Des and I were called to deal with a sudden death and on the way back he said, isn't it strange that none of us can actually visualise our own death? And... Uh, Sort of, it was a strange statement to make. I am convinced that Nilsson's distorted love of death uh, began when he was six years old. The only person he did have a tactile relationship with was his grandfather. One day he was asked did he want to see his grandfather. He said, oh, yes. And he was taken into the kitchen, and on the kitchen table was a long box, and in it was his grandfather lying. Uh, nobody had prepared him for the fact that this was going to be a dead grandfather. So his understanding of love, which had been concentrated on that man, and his understanding of death, which was now concentrated on that body, fused. The most traumatic event of my life was being carried into the room where I was born to look upon my grandfather lying dead in the coffin. I must have subconsciously wished to be in the tomb with my grandfather. When you read material by offenders, you take a lot of it with a pinch of salt. But at the same time, that doesn't mean to say you dismiss it. I think Nelson has understood himself quite a bit in what he's talking about, but by actually, in a way, psychologising it, it's almost like trying to justify it and attribute a blame for it. In my experience, with a lot of offenders, when they're in prison, um, they are unable to carry out their crimes. And the only way that they are able to do this is by writing about them and constantly reliving them and dramatising them. I think one of the outstanding characteristics of his drawings are the childlike quality about them. It's quite a, a, almost a symbolic presentation of how he sees himself, the unhappy little boy. So in a way he's looking for sympathy. 
He's just an arrogant, selfish, cold-hearted killer. All anybody seemed to be concerned about mostly was the fact that he'd dismembered bodies and left them lying around in the flat. That was the sort of shocking thing. Nobody was really that concerned by the fact that he'd murdered and butchered all these homosexuals, but they weren't all homosexuals, they weren't all gay, they weren't all homeless, you know. These were still human lives um, who, who didn't deserve to have that happen to them. I wrote to Nielsen because I just needed answers, mostly why, why, why did you do this? And I got no answers from him. Dennis Nielsen is serving his sentence at Full Sutton Prison near York. Over the last 11 years, he's written three volumes of an autobiography. In 2001, the prison authorities took possession of his manuscript. But there's nothing in law that says Nielsen can't publish. And in a letter to this programme, he explains why he's launched a legal battle to get his manuscript back. These works have been banned by the Home Office for populist political reasons. Everyone, it seems, is allowed to have a second-hand version of my life, while I'm denied any kind of expression of a first-hand version. You can't simply write out uh, Nilsson's own account and leave it at that. My book is based to some extent on Nilsson's prison journals, but I selected from them to see what matters and what doesn't. He can't do it, because it's him. He can't stand outside of himself and see himself as a killer. Over the years, countless people have plagued me with the question why. I can only delve into the dark recesses of the past and present in search of an answer, an answer explored and provided over three volumes. I owe to my victims more than a retributive life sentence in a maximum security prison. I owe them the truth which they are free to accept or reject. I don't think anybody would ever really find that kind of answer from any killer. All I wanted was that he didn't haunt us for the rest of our lives, which he seems to be doing now. And this is the main bugbear of it all, the fact that he's there. The best thing he can do for me is die. Dennis Nielsen lost his freedom 20 years ago and has since been told by successive home secretaries that he'll die in jail. Come on, please. But from next year, it won't be up to the home secretary to decide whether he should be released. Instead, it will fall to a parole board to review Nielsen's case and assess the risk he still poses. I'm convinced that one day, soon, he will be out. Like Hindley was supposed to be done. Like the the Bulger murderers. He's been sentenced to life imprisonment and the, the judge recommended that he serves a minimum of 25 years. Well, in five years' time, he will have served that minimum. Theoretically, it's possible that he can come out in five years' time. With plenty of suspects for the murder of a very unpopular man, it could be a slow process of elimination to who it is. However, a colleague of the victim is adamant that it was in fact him who did it. Is he convincing anyone? Foyle's War returns on Sunday at 8. Coming up next here, it's Night Watch.